Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre, Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudetu Jesus Christus in sequela. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Happy to be joined on this glorious feast day, a glorious day in so many ways, <laughs> by my friend and brother, Michael J.B. Michael, how you doing, brother? Uh, it's a little surreal, but uh, I feel pretty good today. And um, it's kind of funny how, uh, you know, wanted to have this announcement on this particular day, but didn't realize that you know, this would be the day picked to do <laughs> consecration to Russia. So it's kind of providential for me on a personal level. Oh, yeah. It's there's so many great things about this. I just I just realized. Um, so th we're today we're announcing Michael's book, which the working title is Enmity Unveiled. Is there a subtitle yet, Michael? Or is it uh, just Enmity Unveiled for night right now? Yeah, the uh, the timeless struggle between thy seed, her seed, and the knowledge of good and evil. So it broke up a little bit. Oh, Say again. The timeless struggle between thy seed, her seed, and the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, perfect. So it's the Mar it's Mary's victory. This is what the we we titled this show today: Fatima and the Mary's victory over Satan. And so we're going to be talking about Fatima, but Michael's going to go in deep in depth. Uh, to this enmity unveiled, this Marian enmity with Satan that is revealed right in the very beginning, the book of Genesis. There was another providential. So we had already planned on this show. I don't know when it was like a month ago or something. A month and a half or something. Um, and then the other thing was, um, I just realized this today too. Um, the Catholic fighting men in the United States uh, launched a 54-day novena. Um, and this was on January 14. They ran. <laughs> That's my they, birthday. Are you kidding me? What <laughs> yeah. is going on right now? <laughs> <laughs> so on Michael's birthday, uh, January 14, Catholic fighting men in America launched crusade against communism. And this was a 54 day novena, which was going to end today as well. <laughs> so this was a, a 54 day novena. Um, it is the, so they began January 31st and then, uh, 54 day no, rosary novena to end on March 25th today, um, praying against communism. And, and then the announcement came, um, the announcement came that Pope Francis was going to consecrate Russia on Tuesday, just in time for us to start a novena, which we prayed and. Um, I, I, yeah, I, despite criticisms, um, all of the, all of the words were used Bo, uh, Bishop Schneider, we published at one Peter five, he had a response to criticisms and he, he, it was his judgment that, um, this was the most perfect act of consecration, um, to the Immaculate Heart of Russia. Uh, really the, the most perfect fulfillment of the intentions of Fatima. And there's no reports that there was any 
funny business at the consecration nothing changed everything was filmed right there pope francis said the exact words in italian that were on the official italian readout which was translated in multiple languages uh we had diane montagna was there uh we had our our rum correspondent was in saint peter's square he confirmed that everything was said exactly as on the italian so so far so good we're we'll hope for the best prepare for the worst of course <laughs> uh but uh it, it truly is a glorious day to, to be a catholic to celebrate this wonderful feast it's the feast of the annunciation it's also the original date of good friday uh this is the march 25th is this critical date of the year it's also the date of the creation of the world adam's fall so many different things um so it's a great day to be a catholic i i was i was blessed to be able to go to uh, my diocese's consecration earlier today at the same time as the consecration in Rome. Um, it was just wonderful just to be with the bishop, with all the Catholics of my diocese, uh, uniting ourselves together with the Holy Father and all the bishops of the world, doing the same act of consecration. And I really love the prayer. I, I, I think that prayer is is a beautiful prayer in a time of war, uh, really uh, offering ourselves. So, uh, Michael, did you guys have anything in your diocese or anything that you guys did at your parish? Um, nothing that I was able to attend. I did attend mass this morning and um, it was nice because I have a scapular I've had for a while, but we never ended up having it blessed for some reason. I thought we did, but it wasn't. So we actually did it today. Um, and so, cause you have to be there in person and you know, there's like a, a certain routine that goes with it rather than dropping something off for the priest and going back and picking up getting it blessed so it's kind of funny that like i didn't i i asked my wife if i, I didn't we have these blessed she's like no we didn't because father told us there was more that goes with it because we had a lot of things blessed from him a while back and so today was actually a day you got this fatima scapula blessed so it's kind oh, of like fantastic. funny that happened all this morning on on the uh the feast day and um so yeah that was what we did got up bright and early and uh, attended and so yeah a lot a lot going on like i said personally and in the world right absolutely yeah and uh, just a psa announcement um you are allowed to eat meat today uh anytime there's a solemnity according to the new calendar uh you can eat meat not required to eat meat obviously but you are allowed to eat meat on a friday that also goes for for example easter friday the Friday of Easter, that's also a solemnity, for example. So, um, yes, you can eat meat. Uh, shout out to our, our fasting sodality. We're drinking wine today, so I got my Michigan wine celebrating the feast day. Um, so we're going to get into our topic in just a minute. I just want to let everybody know that um, the full series of Christ Against the Occult is available to Guild family members. If you're a part of the Guild, you get, this, get access to the seven-part series. Um, that Michael and I did. Uh, Michael presented all of his research, and he's going to get into some of the backstory of that research in just a minute. Uh, but it's it's really a very in depth history of Christ against the occult. It's uh, you really learn so many different things, so many hidden things of the devil that that he's doing in all these different occult groups and uh, secret societies and everything. Uh, it goes into all the most controversial conspiracy theories that you can imagine. Uh, we, uh, Michael covers all those, including Kabbalah, Jewish occultism, uh, Gnosticism, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have access to that. If you want to be a part of the guild, you can go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic, or you can donate at meaning of Catholic.com. So Michael, let's talk about your book. Where would you like to begin? Um, well, actually it's kind of funny. We did that about a year ago now because it was yeah, during yeah. Lent. I remember um or at least a lot of it um and i remember thinking honestly during that time i was just gonna like kind of stop all the things i was doing i was getting married and you know trying to figure out exactly what the next phase of my life was going to be and so i don't know some weird things happened i thought maybe it was time to put it into a book because it was just have all this stuff that I've researched for a variety of reasons. Um, and I thought maybe I'd, I'd give it a shot. 
And uh, actually, I did the Militia Immaculata consecration for St. Maximilian Colby's uh, Society. Oh, sweet. On, awesome. On May 13th last year. All right. Um, Fantastic. And it was kind of part of it was the intention of like, well, I feel like if I'm, you know, if I was supposed to write something that was kind of intertwined in that, whether it would happen or not, but I was just kind of part of my personal intention with some of it. So my wife and I did that. And that's when we started our first Saturday's devotion. And the funny thing is, like, again, we didn't like plan any of this. Um, the, the, the last, the fifth Saturday actually was our wedding day. And uh, so oh, <laughs> our, our, our wedding day was the mass that we, uh, you know, had the communion on and everything. So Beautiful. it was just kind of a, wow, that's awesome. Very strange. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and then my, my wife was baptized last year on Our Lady of Lord's Feast Day. So, you know, just a lot of interesting things that have synced up with, you know, some of the research that I've done. It's kind of like, uh, I, I didn't really know much about Lord's or I didn't even know who St. Bernadette was until uh, my wife was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take her as my saint because she, you know, didn't really, she just figured it was providential to have that happen on that day. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, th that apparitions in like Southern France where all that Cathar craziness was going on. And I, you know, right. been doing yeah. a lot of research about the kind of weirdness. And uh, so, you know, it's just kind of like, history and then your personal life kind of being intertwined in it it's just very strange and so yeah i've been actually working on it since then and um having enough together to like i guess do an enunciation on the enunciation that was my whole plan so <laughs> yeah. um so yeah it's just kind of funny that all happened today so i guess uh i can just talk about some of the basic things about the book and kind of like the at a personal level to start and then get into some of the research and it will kind of overlap to some of the stuff we discussed, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to mention before I do that. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Absolutely. Well, um, kind of like the, the, the whole theme and the title can be derived from two quotes, uh, one from St. Louis de Montfort, one from St. Maximilian Colby. Um, I won't read the whole quote, but there's like in the quote, I wanted to bold out certain texts so you could just read the bold text and it will read like a sentence on its own and kind of summarize it. Um, so I'll just summarize the two. It's uh, starting with St. Louis de Montfort. God made one enmity between Mary and the devil, the children of the Blessed Virgin and the children of Lucifer. He has inspired her with so much ingenuity and in unveiling the malice of that ancient serpent. And then St. Maximilian Colby says, she will crush your head from Genesis 3.15 is, according to the theologians, to be understood as having no limitations of time. And this work is brought to fruition with Mary, in Mary, and through Mary. So the idea of a timeless battle and that there's no limitations to that, um, according to St. Maximilian Colby, or according to the theologians that he's following, and then the idea that Our Lady unveils the malice of the serpent with so much ingenuity, like, you know, unique ways of showing how much the serpent, you know, hates us. And there's something about that that's, you know, an inspiration. And, and that's what she's part of, according to St. Louis de Montfort. So that's, <laughs> you know, pretty much in line with all the stuff that I've researched and just showing all these really strange ways that, you know, the... Uh, the uh wisest serpents quote that uh is so fitting for this but you obviously want to approach it in a way there you are more inspired to do good things in your life rather than be consumed by it and be all depressed and so that's kind of what's happened for me over the last couple of years is you know seeing all these weird things happen in sync with the roman catholic church I mean, for me, it's more inspiring to to do better. For some people, it might not not be that way. So, you know, it's always the thing where it's like different people have different things that, uh, you know, inspire them or reveal truth and stuff like that. And so I think that, you know, when we talk about like converting people or whatever, and, and what's proof, you know, 
what's proof for me isn't proof for everybody. And I know like there's a certain amount of objectivity that's very important, but for whatever reason, certain people, you know, have a, a moment where they see something that other person would find arbitrary, you know? And so for me, um, a lot of it was just seeing, you know, the, all of the, the ways that the, 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 throughout time and especially 2000 years of the church history, all these secret ways that have been like set up to like mock or invert the Catholic church, specifically Roman Catholic church. And I was just kind of blown away by that, that just, just like, you know, uh, this is otherworldly in, in a, you know, a bad way, but it was just like, it was so shocking to me to see that. And so that's what made me really convinced of the, you know, the, the Catholic church being the true church. Now that might not convince everybody, but for me it did. So that's kind of like my own personal thing, my own personal, like, uh, I guess, investment in this. And I, I kind of relate it in the preface of the book. I, I need to write it a little bit better, but it's going to be kind of, this is my, my personal way of understanding it is, you know, this, the sign of contradiction as it was prophesied to our lady. Um, I think that manifests differently for all of us. Um, and for me, when I grew up, you know, I grew up in the Catholic Church and it was what I'd called kind of like a watered down Novus Ordo kind of culture. And again, I'm not saying that to be disrespectful or anything. It's just the way it was. And I'm very thankful for what I had. But, you know, when I got confirmed and I wasn't the only one, pretty much my entire class, for some reason, we thought that that was our ticket to leave the church oh we got confirmed now we can get out of here like that was our mindset that was just organically our mindset you know and i don't i'm not trying to blame anything on any of the people uh, who educated us or anything like that it's just the way it was you know and so that's a sign of contradiction in itself because confirmation is the exact opposite of that and when i read uh the sacrament of confirmation the council of trent uh maybe a couple years ago, I was just kind of like, whoa, <laughs> this is what I signed up for. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, you're going to bleed for Christ and all these, you know, insane things that, you, you know, or it seemed insane to you at the time. And I never got the slap in the cheek from the bishop. I kind of wish I had, <laughs> but uh, that was what was required back then. So, you know, all these things that you read the, the confirmation in the Catechism of Trent, and you would think, that we would all be like suiting up in our crusader attire at our confirmation, right? But it was the exact opposite. So in my opinion, that's an example of how, you know, the adversary can, can take something sacred and holy uh, and flip it upside down, right? It can convince, you know, a group of teenage boys to think that this is our time to leave, you know, and uh, we've appeased our parents and we don't have to come back to church anymore. Um, so that's what happened to me when I was younger. And, uh, you know, it had a lot of bad effects. Let's just put it uh, minimally there uh, in my life and, you know, a lot of bad decisions. Um, but the I guess the irony, the other sign of contradiction is that when I started wondering more about what's going on in the world and, and you know, seeing a lot of things I thought were weird, you know, you, you <laughs> what do you do? But you go to the Internet when you're a, a millennial, right? I'm a, an elder millennial kind of on the cusp. Um, and, you know, you find all kinds of wacky stuff, but there are certain things that are true enough and you look into different things and then everything's really been designed to pull you into some sort of like new agey theosophical worldview or kind of masonic if you will but just an ideology not like there nobody people on the internet aren't convinced you necessarily to go join a masonic lodge but those kinds of ideas um and the idea that there's like a good masonry and a bad masonry or something like that these are all the kinds of things you'll encounter on the that side of the coin and so if you're grow up and you're not really enamored with christianity you'll probably lean more towards that side and then there's this like this Protestant culture within that. And, um, you know, that will be tied to all kinds of stuff ranging from Nephilim giants that are still around to 
the the Vatican is run by a Jesuit conspiracy or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So what a coincidence they both synthesize on rejecting the Roman Catholic Church, right? So it's kind of like, I, I call it a spiritual dialectic of left-right politics as we are accustomed to understanding it in America. It's kind yeah. of like that Protestant wasp culture um, and then versus the liberal culture that's, you know, more in line with esoteric theosophical ideas. But that's like the spirituality that gets sprinkled on top of each once you realize that you think there's something more than that. Right. But it's just another trap to get you caught in that same dialectic. But you're given the veil of spirituality. Right. Yeah. Uh, at least that's how I came to perceive it over time. It took me quite a while to realize that. Um, and so. Uh, a lot of people were saying lots of things about Freemasonry and New World Order and, you know, the United Nations and theosophy and stuff like that. So I decided to read some books on it and actually get things from the horse's mouth if I could. So I just read Albert Pike or Madame Blavatsky and just see what all the hoopla was about. And I guess what was so strange about it is that over time, you know, Blavatsky would become very emotional and ranty whenever the the roman catholic church came up and at this time i was certainly not enamored with it um and then uh long story short she's she just a few paragraphs and isis unveiled she was ranting about barwell <laughs> augustine barwell and how crazy he was um and how much he didn't understand esotericism and you know all this stuff and so i decided to read memoirs of jacobinism or start reading it and that was the one thing that was just like, it was like, I just realized what a farce the Enlightenment was. And it just completely made all these things make sense. That in conjunction, I would say also with Puritan's empire, because I was like, well, I never thought of listening to a Catholic perspective on things. That was like the one thing I never thought to look at. So I can actually thank Madame Blavatsky for that because of her hatred for it. The Jesuits of the 19th century from when she was writing and uh augustine barwell so that all convinced me intellectually speaking uh of catholicism on some level i was actually considering eastern orthodoxy at some point um but anyways rome went out after a lot of things um and i think that that's the other sign of contradiction it was actually <laughs> The uh, enmity of the serpent that brought me back into the church, where it was a misperception of confirmation that led me out of it. So it's it kind of came full circle in this really strange way. And I think maybe what happened today is kind of a sign of contradiction, right? There's a, a lot of things with Pope Francis that have perhaps been problematic, um, yet that's what the at least the the most legit version of the consecration we've got so far has happened through that, you know? And so right. I don't know what to make of it all, but uh, you know, that seems to be how it works. And I also related to, you know, I mean, that's just what the cross is, right? It's like this sign of a curse and shame and humiliation. And uh, it's, it's just turned into the opposite. And so I think that you notice those things in your own life on some level, and that's kind of the story of the book. And so that's kind of the point of, going through some of the uh, occult views is to kind of show you that specific enmity that is, I mean, it's directed at Christianity in general, but there's so many specific things that invert Roman Catholicism. It's just kind of wild. So that's kind right. of the fundamental premise of the book. Yeah. I think that when you start to see things from this spiritual perspective and look deeper past the facade into the, the deeper elements in these different movements, whether that's Protestantism, Eastern Orthodoxy, occultism, masonry, all sorts of different things, you see that they do have this conspiracy of Antichrist, this this sort of common element, which is anything but Roman Catholicism. And there's this common uh, enmity towards Mary, immaculate, immaculately conceived. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah, and I think that that's another one of those dialectics where, uh, again, the kinds of Protestants, excuse me, the kinds of Protestants that I came across aren't really typical ones, but that was what I'm mostly exposed to. So it was really more of like that 
Alexander Hislop, like the, the Catholic Church is like secretly crypto pagan cult kind of stuff. I would hear that all the time. Um, but then you start to realize there's explanations for any overlap. And that's actually a major theme of the book, which I'll talk about in a second. But I, I was just going to mention that obviously enmity unveiled is a knock on Blavatsky's ISIS unveiled. Um, so the whole point is, and this is getting back to Bernadette inverting the inversion, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, yeah, uh, getting it back to where it was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so the funny thing is, in the 19th century, it's, in my opinion, the 19th century is one of the most hidden centuries ever, because growing up, at least for me, you hear about, OK, there's a civil war. North good, south bad. Abraham Lincoln's a hero. Napoleon was a short guy who, you know, kind of had an ego complex. He did some stuff in Europe. It was kind of good, but kind of bad. And we got Louisiana cheap and that's it. Let's move on to the 20th century. Right. <laughs> I was kind of like, you know, and I, I, I didn't really care about history at all when I was younger. It was just kind of in one year out the other. But that was my perception, you know. And once you start realizing the crazy amounts of anti-Catholicism in the 19th century, I mean, it's just insane. All the different groups that are it's like a litmus test, I call it anti-Jesuit again, Jesuits back then. Uh anti-inquisition which wasn't even really relevant <laughs> anymore you know um and um it's all the the black legend anti-jesuit stuff uh and you know speaking of the situations with the immaculate heart in russia you know it's funny that the russian uh, I, I love dostoevsky uh crime and punishment is actually probably my favorite novel but it's just so ironic that the Russian Orthodox would use they would they would blame the West for liberalism and the Enlightenment, but they would use the same propaganda of the Enlightenment to attack the Catholic Church. It's like unbelievable when 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 certain things go to attack the Catholic Church, it's like everybody has to like invert their standards and ignore some log in their eye. And it just like makes them into a strange hypocrite where it's like, you know, we went over that whole thing with czar paul the first teaming up with the jesuits and almost having a right. reunion back then and it's like those jesuits were helping russian orthodoxy so much during that time and it was like a faction of russian orthodoxy that appreciated it and then a faction that didn't and then there was a bunch of liberals that were tied into like you know masonry and the bible societies that had kind of like illuminism in it kind of seeping in the jesuits were warning against the, all that stuff and then once that czar was assassinated, Alexander took over and he was much more favorable to the liberals for a while. He kind of learned, but it was a little too late. And then you start getting all these revolutions and stuff. And of course, what happened during that century, the Immaculate Conception gets defined as a dogma. Right. They get kind of triggered by that, even though they probably like it seems like contradictory. Like there's a lot of Mariology and everybody's wondering about Lady Wisdom, Sophia, and then. Oh, right. when Rome defines that, all of a sudden, this is just the most heretical thing ever. And it's right, just like, yeah, that's. I think that's uh, one of the most conspicuous things within Eastern Orthodoxy that that kind of proves that there is that they're not the true church. I'm just face value because, and I, it's even written in one of the most famous books in English about the Orthodox Church, written by an Orthodox bishop. It's called the Orthodox Church by Timothy Ware or Callisto's where he's a metropolitan. And it says in that text, which I quote in one of my articles against Eastern Orthodoxy, it says before 1854, there were many Orthodox who either taught the American conception or pretty much said similar things. But after 1854, <laughs> now most Orthodox reject it. I mean, like yeah. that's, that's like all you need to know. It's like, well, you have an enmity with our lady's immaculate conception. Clearly like something's wrong right now. Um, I'm sorry to be so candid right now. I, I'm sure oh, I'm yeah. not, and any Eastern Orthodox would be super offended by what I just said, but uh, yeah, this is. And on the flip side, we're reading about Tsar Paul the first being the head of the Knights of Malta, which a lot of people don't know. Like I've seen Catholic history is very nasty towards him. And I think that that's a travesty because he was obviously trying. He was working with that Jesuit. Like there was so much progress that was made there. And then, there's like these things that were making fun of them in some of the history books I was reading. And, I, you know, it's like, 
there's certain there needs to be a certain amount of mutual respect on either side even if you don't agree and then you know it's just unfortunate that those things happen and then emotions run high with sensitive topics and stuff like that so it, it's going to happen yes. but yes. you know the 19th century like i said it's just I, the other thing too is a crazy amount of wasp propaganda like the protestant regime of america it's it's like really insane and so you know uh in in the 20th century a lot of that perhaps got forgotten and i don't think we you know obviously i don't think there should be any grudge held but I'm, my point is that it, it was very anti-catholic during that time and so i think sometimes there's this perception that america you know the land of religious liberty has always been accepting of catholicism it's just not the case <laughs> no, not but all. again i think that during this time like the, i think being aware of those things is important but never let that like it's a, that was a different era right and so we don't have to worry about that we don't have to dwell on that unlike you know uh just like sometimes eastern orthodox can dwell on the fourth crusade or something like that like to me being honest about history or at least reading certain parts of it there's different ways you can take some things and there's there's wiggle room of course but like to keep bringing up these things that have happened hundreds of years ago as like this point of like it's so relevant now it's just right we need to just get over that you know and so there's a different and that's the other thing too it's like i think when you are uncovering that hidden hidden enmity you don't want that to make you upset now about those same groups now that ha that, that are very different from a long time ago, you know? And yeah. I think that even the strange by byproduct of the enlightenment is it has like watered down a lot of intense religious fervor that is actually problematic. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, like because of that, I mean, obviously the liberalism is horrible and, very destructive but a strange byproduct of that is like now i think that uh you know catholics and jews and probably orthodox in america and protestants are much more aligned when they care about like commandments and the essentials and it's easier to to talk with people who care about that and i think that some of those divisions are a little bit more organically less and less on like a, a regular basis whereas probably on a regular basis i don't know 50 60 70 years ago or more it was probably a lot <laughs> more uh walls put up you know and so just one of those strange ironies at least that's my perception of it and so uh yeah so anyways point being the immaculate conception being dogmatized and then having the uh announcement to saint bernadette from our lady a few years later what's interesting is that that's when madame blavatsky started writing her works just like a, a couple decades after that and it's so interesting because here we have our lady unveiled right i am the immaculate conception and now she's writing this whole like synthesis trying to present an alternative religion because remember this is like out of the enlightenment where this is the romantic era where people are looking for some sort of spirituality this like kind of gothic revival um and there's like the catholic version of that where you see like saint patrick's cathedral built in like that neo-gothic style and stuff like that and then you have like the the occultism kind of coming back and that's where you get people like eliphas levy the baphomet guy and stuff like that there's like this occult revival at the same time and so she's kind of taking charge of that in a way and she's a strange figure because she's tied to like doing weird like medium stuff and in my opinion like probably having demonic things come into her because of that but then she starts writing doctrines that are more in, in the schema naturalistic they deny the supernatural so the way she ends up writing in these books is is denying there's a supernatural world as we would understand it everything that we think is angels and demons are just personifications of natural forces it's 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 science with spirituality sprinkled on it right so she's she's promoting darwinism but with this kind of reincarnation theology and all this kind of stuff and so it's interesting that um you know she she was also known to be a quote unquote virgin um, kind of like a virgin, like uh, Queen Elizabeth, right? The virgin queen, 
or Hypatia of Alexandria is seen as the virgin philosopher in all these esoteric groups. So she's like an alternative virgin. And that's what, you know, Isis is supposed to be. So you can see that, in my opinion, it's like Satan reacting to what happens. And he's actually taking Madame Blavatsky as kind of like his instrument. And he's, you know, anti-inspiring his, his uh, schema yeah. through her. And it's just so interesting because she's really one of the first people who starts to make Lucifer the good guy in a very overt way. Um, and so she, she allegorizes Lucifer for like the pure, he's a symbol of the pure Eastern religion to her and that the West kind of like bastardizes it. And it's, it's all very Gnostic. And so basically it's just, uh, it's kind of like there, this blend of Eastern Hinduism or something uh, with all this stuff and it, it's sprinkled on top of science. And so it's, uh, it, it's very profoundly influential. I think people don't realize how influential she was. We, the reason we have yoga in the West today is because of her mm. philosophical movement and, and her successors. Now there's a lot of infighting in theosophy. So some of the people who branched off of her kind of went in different directions. And so the Lucius trust, that's like a philanthropy group that's tied to the United Nations that's like the Alice Bailey school. They're a little bit more like, as people would commonly understand, new agey, you know, whereas Blavatsky was tied in a lot more of like political revolutionaries. And we talked about like the Carbonari and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, either way, it's all this, the same seed, the serpent seed uh, coming through theosophy. And what's really interesting to me, and the last thing I mentioned on it is that I would hear a lot of people talk about her and be like, oh, she's a fraud and she's like a tool of the new world order or whatever it is. And then they'd start promoting what they think their worldview or what we should all do to spiritually ascend. And it's almost like they're reading from the secret doctrine or ISIS unveiled. It's like they're, they're, they're promoting Blavatsky's worldview, but for some reason they think like she's a, a fraud but I'm showing you that like that's the power of like these ideas. Like people don't even know that they're promoting them. So this like kind of pantheistic, you know, we're all one monistic kind of eco theology, if you will. It's very theosophical. It's got like a universalism uh, in it. And, you know, I think it just influences a lot more things than people think. And so that's why I'm trying to show that, you know, there's a uh, very much an overlap. And I think one of the one of the most interesting influences now i'm not saying uh direct but like overlap is some of carl sagan's writings if you read his book dragons of eden or uh some of his stuff on cosmos it's almost like it was taken right from her writings in certain instances um you know he thinks that uh there's allegories in the bible that teach darwinian evolution and that the serpent giving knowledge is like this agent of fostering transformation in people through evolution. And that's exactly her view. Um, and there's other things too. I won't get into them going on a tangent. I'll have them in the book, but yeah, sure. you know, it's, it's like a mystical Darwinism and that's mm -hmm. really how a lot of the Darwinism started out or it kind of transformed. And uh, that, that really overlaps, I think into a lot of where communism, uh, the heirs of Russia, as we know, it kind of came yeah. out of that. Yeah, you, so you talk, uh, and a lot of those these historical details that you've just touched on are in the series, uh, just so everybody knows. We go into a lot of that stuff, um, Czar Paul and every, everybody like that, the Jesuits and everything. And you talk about this dialectic that's going, that's just sort of taking the good of Christianity, inverting it, and making an opposite mirror picture. And what, what's interesting, I think, there's a lot of like conspiracy series that go around and say, oh, well, th this is this is an occult thing, or this is an occult symbol. And the funny thing is, that it it seems like from what what your research, what I've learned from you, Michael, is that sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. But there's like this overlap because it takes this, it takes it and inverts it, so it has some elements of the truth, but it's just like mixed with the poison of of evil. Um, so here's the question, and and we'll we will also get it more into Fatima as well a little bit later. Um, so what is the scope of your book? Are you going, are you going to be spiritual history of the occult and this enmity all the way back to the beginning, all the way to the present? Is that uh, magnum opus scope? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be 
kind of long, <laughs> but I'm breaking it up into volumes so it's easier to digest. And, all right. you know, I just, uh, if I'm going to do it, you know, kind of go all in at least. Uh, so, so I'm actually going back to Genesis and trying to show a continuity because one thing, like, it's funny, a lot of this researching esoteric writers, like that's a long time ago for me now. Like mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't like opened up any of these books to like know more about them unless it's like been, oh, I wonder what she says about this, like kind of peripheral stuff in several years. Like it's probably been three or four years now. And ever since then, I've just been reading Catholic history and, and also uh, Catholic commentary and, and, you know, literature like St. Louis de Montfort or uh, uh, one of the things I'm going to apply a lot is like uh, what extra here, here, keep, keep talking, Michael. Story. I gotta, I gotta take care of some kids. <laughs> sure. Right. No problem. Good, just a minute. Um, yeah. So basically I guess all the, the sub themes that are embedded into it, um, the, the powers and principalities scheme, the idea of uh, the way the, the spiritual realm works according to, you know, Catholic exorcist tradition, people like Father Chad Ripperger, especially, um, and kind of the way they outline it. Um, if you just take what they say and the way they say everything works and you like apply it to different things in history or even the way like Gnostics started thinking about the world and stuff like that, you actually see continuities. So part of the work is to provide almost like evidence or data to support what some of these exorcists are saying. Um, and, you know, so there, there are certain things that are, I, don't know, I guess you could say more speculative or more showing stuff that's like, uh, lending credence to something but you know it's kind of mixing that with like also showing stuff in, in catholic teaching or going to a lot of church fathers seeing what they say about this or that and kind of applying it and um the other let's see here i have just a couple notes um yeah the other thing that i wanted to Mention is the uh, the idea of the seeds of the word. I know that's like a, a some people think that that's like a Vatican II ecumenical modernist type thing. Um, I just think that a lot of these things can be applied in problematic ways. But the idea that th there's this relationship of Israel and the Gentiles in the Old Testament that isn't always as separate as people think, uh, because. I've gone through and I've read a lot of, especially the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible commentaries on the Old Testament are super helpful. And it shows how there's so many things that the Israelites kind of adopted from the surrounding cultures, but purified them and transformed them. So the idea is that God can use, you know, the, the Gentile cultures that's under the dominion of the adversary. Again, a qualified dominion is being allowed to, you know, be the... Uh, the driver of their culture, I guess. Um, but there are certain things in there that have truth in them, right? So it's the idea of the seeds of the word. Um, and uh, I think Lumen Gentium has a really good passage talking about how those things are taken by the church and purified of the bad things and then transformed. And you actually see that with a lot of things like even the Ark of the Covenant the way that sanctuary is designed was mimicking like the sanctuaries of other nations like Egypt or something. Um, so they had the same types of things, their, their laws and, you know, priestly staffs or whatever uh, in them. And then also the Davidic monarchy uh, it was kind of modeled off of some of the local monarchies, but in a different way where the mother is the queen rather than the wife is the queen. And uh, it's kind of funny that the, the reason for that is because <laughs> the, there was a lot of wives. And so when you have many wives of the king, how do you know which one's queen? So it was a lot easier for the mother of the king to be the queen. So it's kind of like 
taking good out of evil to show what the heavenly monarchy is with our lady as queen and things like that. So you can actually see that happen in the Catholic church, especially in the, uh, uh, the early days with their, the church fathers are trying to figure out how do we deal with Greek philosophy and then Roman law and purging the problematic parts of it, but co-opting what is good. And actually another thing that's really interesting in it, I noticed is that the occult writers like Blavatsky will actually attack other pagan religions that lend more towards Catholicism. There's an example of like Zoroastrianism. Um, it started to develop, especially in its later years, this idea of like heaven and hell and judgment. Um, and this kind of like uh, light and dark, like the, the, the kind of stuff you'd read in like John's gospel, right? Um, you know, the, the children of light, children of darkness. And I think that this was a lot more embedded in like the Essene communities. And that's something I, I think is very fascinating too. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, the, um, yeah, so there's like this overlap there. And so she's like attacking that and trying to purge, uh, Tim, I was just talking about the, the seeds of the word and how the occult even attacks some of the, the, the pagan philosophies that lend mm. towards Catholicism and the Zoroastrian, Zoroastrianism was I was talking about. And so Blavatsky's trying to say that the, 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 the whole like heaven and hell Zoroastrianism and, and the idea of a judgment, that's like the bad version. And the real version goes back to like Hinduism where good and evil are just two sides of the same thing and, and basically equal. Right. Like the real yeah. God is beyond good and evil. And then we just kind of invent it. Um, and so it's really interesting when you see, that the adversary actually attacks the truth in other religions, but it doesn't mean that if you're looking for those things, you kind of form a staunch line between the bad practices, right? And so this is where like the ecumenism has gotten a bad name because, you know, we're so used to thinking Pachi Mama or whatever, right? Because we, we see that happen all over the place. Oh, all religions have truths and they all kind of lead to the same place. You know, that kind of stuff, that's a problem. But that is, the the idea in and of itself is not bad. And that goes all the way back to the church fathers. And I, I was saying, it actually goes back to ancient Israel, the way they adopt some of the customs of the, the nations around them, but they purify them and, and transform them. And then that's God's providence over the adversary trying to, you know, run amok <laughs> and it doesn't matter. You know, it's always working together for good. Yeah. There was this, um, there was a con the controversy about the consecration of Russia that we, again, refer readers and viewers to one Peter five, where Bishop Schneider responded to the earth of heaven controversy, because there was a, some controversy because there's an invocation of our lady under the title earth of heaven. And there were the explanation from the Holy See was that this is this is a, a, a title which is used to uh, illustrate or symbolize the, the union of heaven and earth in Our Lady. But in the fact that she's the earth of heaven, because she's purely natural, she's not a she's not a God, she's a creature. Um, and Bishop Schneider said that there's no problem with this. And he cited multiple examples from Eastern and Western Christendom using this or similar very similar title um and i think that that title it reminded me of that because what you're just saying is that it's the union of the natural logos which is god created in every human being by means of creating one in in his own image union of the natural logos with the supernatural logos and that's that seeds of the word the, the logos spermaticos of saint justin martyr what's up buddy go ahead michael yeah, and I think that, you know, people think about like weaponized ambiguity or whatever, and that stuff certainly happens. Um, but I think what's more important is that if you know what it means to you and, and you're interpreting it, I you know, I guess in an orthodox way, that's kind of a cliched thing to say, I guess. But, um, you know, if, if certain people in the, the ecclesial sphere are, are saying those things and it is or, seems orthodox, but it could be interpreted for the bad synchronistic version. I mean, that's on them. 
you know so I, I feel like sometimes people get a little paranoid that like oh this won't ex be accepted because of this or that and it's just like i mean that's why that the hierarchy is there that's on them if they're doing it in a way that has some funny business internally or whatever you know and so i just don't worry about that because otherwise you're just going to go mad trying to wonder about people's intentions and stuff like that and you know we have enough problems and, and our own flaws that we need to deal with so i'm just rather focus on them and you know I think with the consecration stuff, I guess we'll talk about this more at the end. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of the way it works. Like, you think about it in the, I think it's the Gospel of John where Caiaphas, you know, gives a prophecy that uh, one man, I, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember exactly what it is, but one man will will die for the salvation of all Israel or something like that. Now, he obviously... It was intending it like, oh, if we kill this guy, Jesus, then that will save all Israel because he's just leading everybody astray. <laughs> it was the exact opposite of what he was intending, but it was still a prophecy. Um, so, Tim, I don't know if you heard that. I'm talking about the the Caiaphas prophecy. Oh, yes. One man dies for all of Israel, and that wasn't the way he intended it to go, but that was what actually happened in reality. So I think what's most important is God sees reality exactly objectively as it is right so when we ask for peace god knows exactly what peace is so if we get a version of that we don't like it, you know it, it's like the, if, if heaven gives you what you ask for you're going to get what that actually is and sometimes you're surprised about what that actually is so i guess we'll just have to wait and see but that was kind of a saying is like don't i wouldn't worry so much about intentions or is this could this be seen as masonic or not like it doesn't matter that's on the people that themselves if they're thinking about it in an alternative way in a more synchronistic pachimama way if that's really what is in their heart when they're doing these things that's on them it's not on us you know yeah uh my good friend Ilya is asking do you know jonathan peugeot now i don't know jonathan peugeot but people keep asking me about him and i do know that the symbolic world. Uh, I think that's the term, the, the name of his channel. Shout out to Jonathan. I um, respect to you. He, he's an Eastern Orthodox um, art. You, do, are you familiar with Peugeot? Michael? I know who he is. I just haven't really listened to him much. I've seen yeah, him I, on a couple of shows before. Not for lack of interest. I, I certainly am interested. I, I was just getting into um, actually I, I, one of the good Protestants, jo um, James Jordan. He is a. Um, He's actually recommended to me by another Eastern Orthodox, Cabain, and then my friend Byzantine Scotus. Um, and he's just talking about biblical symbolism and typology. The Bible uses all these different symbols, and they mean something. Like, uh, in the beginning, the earth was formless and void, and the spirit hovered over the waters. That's all this symbolic language that has specific meanings. And so, uh, and this is just the way that. God uses symbols. God has God has created the world, and the whole world is symbolic. And this is just the way that um, the the church fathers understood it. This is a, a Christian Neoplatonism. Uh, it's just sort of like normal the normal way of doing things. But a hyper Aristotelianism can sometimes obscure that to a degree. Or the Eastern Orthodox criticize, for example, the realism of Renaissance art as being not symbolic enough. Uh, which there is there is a, a just critique in a sense there, but it's also could be too much as well, because obviously realism in art is still symbolic because it's create it's just imitating the real and the real in out in the world is itself symbolic. So anyhow. Yeah, exactly. Note. And that's that, that I think that's, that's what's so attractive about a lot of occultism is it touches on all those sorts of things, typology, symbology or whatever. But it's inherently subjective, right? It's, it's, it's really, it's the, the great man theory, right? Where it's like, Oh, if somebody rises up, they're seizing their solar destiny in their journey. It's like Joseph Smith, you know, solar hero stuff where it's like, <laughs> Je Jesus is a solar hero, just like Osiris or whatever. Right. That they're, so they're, e they're equilibrating everything and synchronizing everything where, where Jesus is, our Lord is relegated you know, and, and that's what masonry does. And so it's kind of like, 
um but it uses a lot of the archetypes and stuff like that but it's not attached to an objective tradition or morality um and this is what I, that the book has a lot of these types of things i love typology i go into a lot of that but uh the, you know like as you know from your book the city of god city of man the, the city of man and Cain is like the first great man theory. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was that was one of the things I mentioned where it's like it's named after yourself and then or, or your progeny. But, uh, you know, your own personal tradition. The I irony is Cain, who wouldn't sacrifice the first fruits, is his first fruits is his kid that he names the city after. So he, he'll use his first fruits for his own name. Right. But not for God. And so. um you kind of see that playing off and then you know think about all the heresies most heretical groups are named by the person right the lutherans the waldensians the waldo or whatever right yeah um and so i mean there's a difference between that and you're starting a society in the church like the franciscans but you're not your own sect that's telling you how to interpret everything no it's the roman catholic church but you're a subgroup within that you know what i mean to me that makes a lot more sense and so you know, it's kind of funny how, in my opinion, you know, the Enlightenment and that whole great man theory, occultism kind of, again, sprinkles spirituality on that. And, that, you know, that's why I love crime and punishment, because that's kind of a refutation of that theory, because like Raskolnikov succumbing to that. He thinks Napoleon's a great man. Right. And some great men can do what they will if they want to seize their destiny. And actually, it's kind of funny. Aleister Crowley even uses that same example of napoleon like seizing his destiny so my, my point is that so much of the occultism is just enlightenment principles but they just throw some sort of spiritual lingo or understanding on top of it and right. that's a major theme of the book is just how much modern science it it, it it that's the dialectic they're they're so similar in these fundamental ways but for somebody who wants to be more mystical or somebody who wants to be more rationalist they have that that avenue but it's always synthesized on the same enlightenment propaganda calling the catholic church the dark ages and the, the crusades were horrible yeah. and you know and not not understanding the context of the situations right uh ignatian examine says michael's work is the best out there for occultists who came to catholicism so question is what what are your hopes for this book for people who are into occultism do you have you experienced any people who were kind of brought over from occultism tell us about that yeah, I've had a lot of people reach out to me about that. And it's, uh, you know, it's it's very humbling. And uh, that that was the whole reason I ever continue doing the research, you know. Um, and, you know, it's 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 I, you know, if you uh, the golden rule do unto others what you'd want done to yourself. I, I just think about it like if I was looking at these things again from square one what would be useful for me to know about, right? And so my whole thing is at least understand exactly what Gnosticism is telling you. It's telling you the creator of the world is evil. <laughs> That's the objective fact of Gnosticism. But of course, that creator is the God of Israel that they're applying that specifically to. Now, if you're going to do that, start measuring the same standards of what the, you know, the, the church tradition actually says and what actually teaches and not what some person who's angry thinks it teaches. And now, you know, I've succumbed to these things myself. You know, I've, I promoted black legend propaganda before I've been, you know, a Protestant cranky naysayer before, but like that kind of organically comes across you. And then you kind of hit a ceiling where you're confronted with that. You're like, Oh, Whoa, <laughs> I was totally wrong. And I'm an idiot. Right. So you have a lot of those moments and um, you know, I, I just think, it's it's really helpful if you're able to have that information and you can accept it or reject it you know so if i was going to say who's the book for if there was an umbrella group it would just be a group of people who would say okay i'm seeing western civilization right now and it's overrun by crazy nutty insanity that is you know sjw communist revolution and, but it's like a, just this idiocracy version of it. And I don't want that. Right? So if you say that and then you're wondering, maybe there is something true and real or whatever that you don't know what it is, you know, 
if as long as you're rejecting that, I think that it's kind of for those people and and that can be for a lot of people, whether you're you have a Jewish background, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Muslim, whatever. You're 1776er, right? And so I think if people are earnest about hearing the viewpoint, I would think that you would at least have to come away and be like, okay, the Catholic Church is nowhere near as bad as I thought it was. In fact, I respect it, even if I maybe don't agree or I, I'm not ready to join. That would be like one basic level of it. And then hopefully for anybody who maybe like me grew up Catholic and once you actually kind of hear this whole other tradition that you never knew existed and it makes sense to you, it's inspiring to come back. And then maybe I try to identify some problems in, in Protestantism or whatever, but but more so that it, it could also purify things for them too. It's like if, if Protestants, like just get rid of the, the argument that call no man your father and Catholics call it priest father. That's like the, the worst argument of all time because Paul says, call me a spiritual father, right? If they could just get rid of their own bad arguments, that would actually help them a lot more and, and help for a lot more of a better discussion and get rid of these silly things, you know? And so it's not meant to be polemical, but it's meant to show problems that you hit with some of these viewpoints. And it's not to say that Roman Catholicism doesn't have its own problems, but it's just like trying to measure objective standards in all these situations. And I think if you do that, you know, you 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 have to at least come away with the case like, oh, okay, Roman Catholicism isn't as crazy as I thought it was, you know? So trying yeah. to not be polemical and, and nasty, but at the same time being honest about the issues, because these are the things you're going to come across. And so that's kind of one of the layers of it. And then, you know, from that, the people who might be into these sorts of ideas or like the people who might be more inclined towards new age stuff, you know, it's, it's kind of like there's a special part of it there for them, because that's just kind of part of my journey where that's what I, I don't know, I kind of lent more toward, I, I had like a certain bout with Protestantism. And there was some things that I, I really appreciated about what I listened to. I, I decided to bite the bullet and listen to the Protestant viewpoints. I listened to people like they're more ev evangelicals, like Chuck Missler or somebody like that. I was just like listening and getting their viewpoint. And I was like, okay, the things I think are kind of nutty, I'm just going to set them aside. And the things that I think are profound or interesting, I, I oh, th those are I have to admit that's that's a really interesting way of looking at it, a really nice way of looking at you know things or it's a harsh truth that I, I I realize is true and then the funny thing is as I got to Roman Catholicism all those things I kind of took with me were actually just Catholic things you're right so, right so you know there there's a certain amount of of harmony that can be there and when you deal with the differences you know you just say your piece and you you try not to harp on them so I I try to write like that it, you know it, it might not always come across like that, but I'm, it's always in my mind. And so I want to, you know, have that umbrella for people who, you know, again, see the errors of Russia running everywhere. And then hopefully maybe if it explains some things. And, and I know that for a lot of people in Protestantism, they they get frustrated with some of the, the things that they, you know, the ceilings they hit, you know. And so maybe that would be also useful. And so I, I kind of look at... uh a lot of people are, it's a kind of like a big blue lodge of masonry where well, there's a lot of people like have this idea about God. God is good. There's a creator. Maybe there's morality, but they're just not sure about the definitions of that. And so I think when people are in that state and they're just open to hearing stuff, there's no reason to be nasty about anything or, or whatever at all, you know, and, and just, um, you know, from what I've known is like another people converting that I know around me or, you know, with with my wife before we were married and stuff. It's like people take time to, to figure things out. And as long as you see progress or whatever, like, you know, you have to deal with a lot of flaws in, in yourself and other people. And so, you know, there's just so many of those things I try to be aware of when I'm writing the stuff so hopefully it comes across yeah yeah so how do we got about a half an hour and um before we close out here so mm -hmm. what how does fatima tie into this overarching enmity unveiled story that shows mary's victory well i think what it is is 
the Fatima stuff, I don't really address it specifically. It's more um, things that happen in old Israel that you see happen in, in new Israel in the church and Western civilization. And so those things that repeat are always present. And, um, you know, if you look at the first century apocalypse, if you will, you see a lot of those themes that I think are repeating now in a lot of ways. And I call them like echoes, you know, where it's like, I, I feel like sometimes just my opinion, but you know, there's, the, there's an historical objective aspect of the apocalypse of the first century. Right. Um, and then there's, like you said, themes, broad themes that kind of are always present whenever there's these apocalyptic eras. And what I mean by that is an era where there's more unveilings, right? More things are are being unearthed. And I'd say that over the past five, six years, there's been a lot of things unearthed, not, not very pretty things a lot of the times, but I think that when all the ugly demonic stuff is being unearthed, you actually kind of miss some of the the better things that are um, and, you know, I think that with all the Fatima stuff, whatever happens, it just shows that it's so relevant to everything going on. And that's a distinctly Catholic thing. Right. Um, and it was, you know, shunned for quite a while, but I think that it's hard to say that it's, it's not very relative, relevant to everything going on now. So I think really just in my opinion, I do a lot of comparing, contrasting of, mary or mariology and lucifer and it kind of shows you this interesting inversion where um you know this gets back to the 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 father ripperger and the exorcist schema where i think that that's a lot of what you know father ripperger talks about people like that is tied into like a lot of fatima stuff and and right now, you, I think you see a lot of demonic behavior being exposed and you see actually demonic personalities coming out and the way it's all described, like his, his series on communism and, and de demonic psychology, I think is what it's called. It's like the way he describes that is exactly what you see. And that is, in my opinion, what you see is like the, the errors of Russia. And so what I'm trying to do is is take that schema. And so there's like th three three things, I think, that are kind of really interesting with all of this. Um, with the powers and principalities scheme, as I would call it, you know, Father Richard says that demons uh, can get an attachment to places or locations. Um, I would also argue maybe in the reverse, they might hate certain locations because of what happened there. Right. Um, and so if you think about it from a subjective level, I mean, think about what what's what does Rome represent? That's when Satan was cast out right the powers and principalities were cast out and it became holy rome so perhaps the reason the devil hates latin as people say is because it always reminds him of that time where you know he was crushed and didn't quite see it coming perhaps or you know if they knew what they were doing they wouldn't have crucified the lord of glory right and so I think you can see that kind of playing out with like Southern France, you know, what, that's something that's very interesting about Southern France is, you know, who, who really brought Catholicism there? St. Irenaeus, right? Um, and, and, you know, he, he comes over from the East. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, he refutes all the Gnostics, right? <laughs> Guess what happens a thousand years later? That's when a Cathar bishop went over to Southern France and brought all the stuff that Irenaeus was refuting. Mm -hmm. it's like funny it's like a thousand years later that's kind of interesting you know and i think that 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 there's another thing where like i know the millennium is is symbolic but i think sometimes you see like you know a literal thousand years kind of built into stuff i mean that's what the dark ages is the enlightenment they think it's a thousand years of darkness and so i think you can kind of have a both and thing that happens with a lot of stuff so it's like okay there's an historical apocalypse from the first century ad then there's like the final one and then there's weird echoes of it that we see and they can both work together. So sometimes people get really upset or obsessed with like, what is the mark of the beast? Let's figure out what this one thing is where it's a lot of different things, but there is also a linear aspect to it and a specific one. I think you've talked about this before. It's like revelation, right? It's like there, there are certain types or typologies that you see echo. And a great example is like St. John Fisher, right? He's like a new saint 
John the Baptist. Right. Yeah. You know, and so th these things happen, I think, a lot. And, and they don't always happen. It, the, the broad scopes are there, but like the details are always different for everybody's own personal situation. So for my opinion with the Fatima stuff, I guess maybe this could kind of relate is one thing I noticed going through the Old Testament is it's uncanny some of the relationships of the Northern Kingdom's revolt to the Southern Kingdom of the Protestants revolting against Catholicism. Um, the Northern Kingdom rejected the Great Lady, which is the Queen, the Davidic Queen. So it would be Our Lady, right? And so the, the Protestants, the more they went off into Protestantism, the more they they started to reject Mary, uh, Marian dogmas, and this kind of enmity towards Mary, right? And so that's what happened with the the northern kingdoms. They rejected the Davidic kingdom and the the Gibara, uh, the, the the great lady of Israel. And then they formed their own cults, but they started mixing in with, you know, the Canaanite and, and, and culture and whatever. So it became the Samaritans became kind of this mixture of kind of Jewish things or, or southern, you know. Uh, Israelite things, but with pagan things. And look what happened to the Protestants that led to the Enlightenment. And so there's masonry is kind of like this weird Samaritan, like there's sort of Jewish Christian symbols, but it's also pagan and naturalistic. And so, and also they went into captivity earlier. And if you look at, Pro I mean, the, the Catholic South had its own problems, right? Just like the Southern Kingdom of Judah, but they had certain reforms that were successful and then they didn't go into full on captivity till many like a hundred something years later or whatever. So if you look at the, the Protestant reformation, so-called there's just a lot of very interesting parallels there. Um, and so I think that, you know, I'm not saying this is just my opinion and stuff, but I'm just trying to show that like, there's nothing new under the sun, you know? And um, I think it's just a uh, very interesting because you can learn from the old testament just as much as you can from our own history and that kind of just shows the holistic nature of the timeless battle if you will and so that's right. something i was going to talk about here's a question um is the consecration of russia because you mentioned um places and nations because russia was becoming infected obviously with communism which is demonic um is there anything to the consecration of Russia to Mary, to her Immaculate Heart, uh, that's sort of reclaiming something that was taken by the devils? How do you understand the, the specific consecration of Russia in terms of, is it is it like the demonology of, of places and hauntings and that type of thing? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you can always see something weird going on. Like, obviously, the Ukraine area in kiev or whatever that has a lot of rich history with certain battles and we talked about this you know in the series where there was that university that kind of had like jesuit education trickling in and they were kind of battling between like protestant ideas and catholic ideas and forming their own theology um and so that area just seems to be very interesting and also consider that you know it, it was at the dewey reams where the ark lands in armenia um, and then the Armenian church is one of the first Christendoms, right? Um, so the old Ark and the new Ark kind of thing. And so, you know, perhaps the devil does not like Armenia, like in that schema. And then look at like the Armenian genocide. There's all these things that are always in that area of Georgia and Azerbaijan or whatever, you know, and again, these are broad strokes, but you can, you can see these things and just like Southern France that I was talking about, uh, St. Irenaeus. Then later they bring the Cathars over and then the crusade comes. And then, you know, there's much, a lot of polemics against the Cathar crusade. And, you know, it, everything has its abuses. But once that was cleared out, um, you have the 13th century kind of golden age of Christendom in, in that, that general area. And I think it's relating to a period of peace, right? Um, you know, think about that era, the 13th century. You know, St. Louis the Ninth. you have scholasticism, you have all these awesome things, but you also have the Guelph Ghibelline battle that's like raging for 100 years or whatever. So, you know, the, the utopian peace versus the Christian peace where it's like, 
what I what I would think is it's like controlled chaos. To me, that's like what Christendom is, you know, um, versus if you don't have that, if you don't have the laws in place, it turns into open borders chaos. And that's what we see now. And I think that that's, you know, that's just my personal opinion. But I think that, you know, the idea of the the peace or whatever, but back to the, the whole Russia thing. One thing that I think is interesting, you know, thinking about like the, the thousand years of Christianity uh, with various regimes, right? You have the Holy Roman Empire, right? You have uh, Charlemagne to Napoleon dissolving it a thousand years later, just about. Um, you have Byzantium, a thousand years of that. Um, Russia didn't quite have a thousand years. I think of Vladimir the Great, it was like nine, 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 yeah, something. They didn't quite make it a thousand years and the, the Bolshevik Revolution happened. But then you know, in the, the the fall of the Soviet Union, whatever, if you, you start seeing Christian things coming back, you know, it, it's just kind of interesting uh, that it's just like a almost a thousand years. And so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I just find it interesting. These are kind of things that I think are unique and kind of inspiring to see God's providence. But, you know, it's not something that's you know, I'm not trying to promote this as like some dogmatic way of looking at it. It's just, yeah. I find it interesting, you know? Okay. So uh, our friend Andrea, he says, um, he's thinking Fatima is more linked to the danger of communism, whereas occultism is more some perverted form of religion, more linked to Nazism, New Age, LGBT. So do you see occultism in the communist threat as well? Is it the, is it just a dialectic? What are your thoughts on that? Um, actually, I think that communism and Marxism is like this crypto Gnosticism. And what I mean by that, uh, I think we've talked about this a little bit, is, you know, again, what is the the Gnostic, one of the Gnostic stories of creation so-called is on the origin of the world. And the whole point is that the Gnostic Sophia, right, the wisdom, uh, she aborts the creator. Right. Yal de Bayat is the Gnostic. It's the God of Israel. That's the Gnostic cosmology. The God of Israel is this evil, disgusting beast. And aborting him in creation is salvation, basically. That's like the the the, the hardcore group of the Gnostics is the Ophites and the Apocryphon of John and, and some of these Gnostic texts. I mean, they're just horribly anti-Catholic. It's like it's really crazy how screwed up they are. If you objectively list it out. And that was actually one thing I was going to mention about like Father Ripperger. He says that the demons can't get you to sin subjectively, like in your own personal life. They'll get you to objectively sin in the sense that you don't even kind of know it just to spite God. So that's what I think a lot of these things are. So you, you hear a lot of people like, oh, I'm like a Gnostic Christian. And they, they, they like created things. They like the idea of a good creator, but that's not objectively Gnosticism. So it's kind of like, People, if you understand the objective exegesis of these things, like so often this happens. So back to, to the Marxism, um, this is just my personal opinion, but I think that the errors of Russia really center around abortion because mm. uh, I was reading some like liberal Russian professor. She's very proud of this, that 1917, the Bolsheviks legalizing abortion was like historic in the sense that it was the first time I think it happened in a Christian country, but also under the understanding of, of women's liberation. And so there's this this thing in Gnosticism that's built into like the patriarchal God is like the God of Israel. And Sophia is like this kind of like androgynous feminist force that's like. Uh, how shall I put this violated by him Um it's kind of a disgusting thing. I won't get into it, but basically, you, you know, it, 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 the the Me Too culture has this weird Gnostic thing built into it. And again, I'm not trying to like denigrate things that have actually happened, but I'm just saying this this whole idea of like the patriarchy oppressing women or whatever, and, and then aborting the creator. It's like, what does that represent? Uh, in like a a practical sense, right? If, if uh, like Alistair Crowley talks about this, that ritual magic, like if you reenact the myth of a deity, you like have this powerful effect of magic. That's what he says. So it's like, 
this is why it's weird when you see like halftime shows and like Madonna comes out as like the goddess Isis, right? <laughs> There's like they're reenacting myths of deities. They don't, do they know it? But the Gnostic Sophia is like this feminine force aborting the creator and aborting creation. So you could actually look at it that sense that women having abortion is almost like an anti sacrament where it's like you are actually participating in that like myth. And what's really interesting is in certain strands of Gnosticism, again, these are like what all the Gnostic scholars themselves say about it, is there's this understanding that spirit and Sophia is like uh, this, this holy spirit so-called in exile and it moves throughout history through matter and dialectics to transcend it. And if you read Marx and Gnosticism about like dialectics and then transcending, it just so, it overlaps so much. I'm, I'm not getting the quotes right exactly in my head. I'm just trying to remember it. This was all going to be written down in the book. But the point is there's like this alternative Holy Spirit moving and working through creation. But the Gnostic version is you're purging <laughs> the God of Israel. And so what is the Marxism like? They they uh, they ran with evolutionary theory. Um, and it's kind of like this dialectical materialism but the gnostic schema is that the one strand is that the world is better than the creator but the creator who organized it and fashioned it is flawed so we transcend that um and so there's just so many parallels uh, and, and it's salvation by knowledge and and you know science and you know if you if you don't believe in darwin you're stupid right that's kind of like the the, the modern world's viewpoint right and so there's just so many strange parallels with that. And we talked about how a lot of these communist ideas go back to those radical Franciscans of the Middle Ages that were the heretical spirituals that got into these weird kind of kind of goddess cults of the Holy Spirit, the feminine Holy Spirit. Right. So that's mm -hmm. like that's like Sophia Gnosticism. Right. And so Blavatsky reinvents all this stuff where Lucifer becomes the Sophia and and Lucifer is actually uh if he's a Caribbean angel, those are the Gnosis angels where well, the seraphim are higher and they're the, the burning fire of charity. And so you can actually see it in the hierarchy of the angels where like the fire of charity is above intellectual knowledge. Right. And so if that's part of Lucifer's nature as being a, a knowledge angel, then Gnosticism would probably be his favorite heresy. That's kind of like what I was going to posit. And so you, you see so many of these parallels involved in communism, but they think it's atheistic, but I'd argue it's actually just a secret objective kind of manifestation in a modern way. And that, you know, they create their anti commandments, right? It's like bearing false witness is like a sacrament or a, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, as long as you're fighting fascism, you can lie about anybody, right? Uh, you know, do what thou wilt with your sexual morality, you know create any kind of cult you want you know these are kind of it, it really is just the catholic schema turned upside down on its head so i think there is very much a religious element in it even if people don't think that there is uh it's just kind of hidden you know yeah it's interesting how much abortion is an attack not only on all women but on the virgin mary in particular because she is the mother of the son of god and when you throw in this narcissism and this denial of the material world there is this great enmity with motherhood in general and the virgin mary in particular and it's it's, it's incredible how in 1917 in that fateful year right before fatima happened there was a communist rev revolution there was already a communist revolution happening in mexico but mexico is the center of marian devotion in the americas with our lady of guadalupe so the the demons we have this like demonic revolt across the world in 1917 we have we have uh the communists take over uh mexico this was actually the very first communist country before the soviets and then we have what's interesting is that right at in may of 1917 right when our lady of fatima is happening in the same month which is obviously the month of mary we have the first set up the russian greek catholic church by Sheptisky, he ordains Blessed Leonid Fedorov to be the Russian Greek Catholic exarch in Russia, and he consecrates Russia to the to Mary in in that uh, in this this is a synod of Petrograd in, in May of 1917, hmm. and he actually asks for he asks God that um, God would 
uh, basically convert Russia to Catholic faith, Russian Catholic faith, uh, consecrating Russia to Mary and asks for the, that God be God grant the church many martyrs and confessors of the faith. And that prayer was granted. And now we have this hundred years of persecution of the church. And um, so it's it's really incredible. <laughs> and I but, think that, yeah. you know, a lot of people talk about like the capitalist interests financing things, Bolsheviks or whatever. I mean, and they say, oh, well, it's not really like the eras of Russia is capital. It's kind of like that cop capitalist communist dialectic. And it's like, well, capitalism has spread contraception, abortion as well. And in fact, um, uh, one of the financiers, not of the Bolshevik revolution, but uh, Jacob Schiff, I think finance, I think it's Kerensky. He was a Freemason that was part of the regime that overthrew the czar. And then the Bolsheviks overthrew that regime in the October revolution. Right. And so it's interesting that that, that guy Schiff, he ended up becoming like a Zionist and Zionism was like a reaction to Bolshevism. And what happened was he, he started financing some of these groups that uh, was Margaret Sanger is tied to. Margaret Sanger was a theosophist um, and she went over to India and had this whole mission about promoting contraception. Now, their understanding, as far as I know, was that contraception was supposed to stop abortions. Right. That's like the other seed of the serpent. It hadn't spread. But in my opinion, that's how it started to spread. And now look at us today where what is the main thing that has like spread throughout the world you know the, the the abortion on demand all over the world right that's like the 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 dream of the the western liberal agenda that what it's turned into you know and so if you look at it in that context i mean i'd say it's pretty much spread you know and um you, you have other things that go with it but i think that what's unique about the bolshevik revolution as far as i was reading from these professors is that allowing abortion into law and again the demons are legalists um that is unique and what is that that's so unique to inverting our lady like there's nothing more anti that our lady and and birthing the savior than the gnostic quote unquote abortion of the savior right it's like lucifer's consciousness is like flowing through the gnostic text hmm. levatsky runs with that and transforms it later and now like you know she was tied to a lot of these liberal revolutionaries group. Honestly, actually, she was Russian. Um, oh, you're right. okay. And uh, and so, but she was getting into all this like Eastern mysticism or whatever. And so, like I said, mm -hmm. Margaret Sanger was a theosophist, and uh, the Theosophical Society was tied to a lot of these sorts of things. And again, that a lot of those ideas are tied into the UN and that Lucius Trust organization. I mean, you know, there's a lot of philanthropy groups, so called, that are part of the UN. Um, but they have a, I think one of their offices is right in the UN uh, complex in New York City. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, you, you talked about that in part one of the Christ Against the Occult, the, the, U, the occult connections with the UN. And the, you deal a lot with the symbols, as, as that was brought up earlier. And it reminds me of what we talked about in, in another one of our Guild family shows, the demo, demonology of geopolitics. Uh, there was this this uh, demonic abortion going on in France right when when Christ came to consecrate France to to the Sacred Heart, um, and it was really bad. It was terrible uh, at that time. It's it's really quite insane. And that sets a was. precedence for a hundred right. year period. There you go. There's another hundred year period because right there, the wasn't the of God, king of right? France stripped of his rights like a hundred years to the day or something like that. Yes, yeah. So that was that hundred year period. So, anyways, um, so we're all out of time though. Enmity unveiled. You can stay um, if you're not already subscribed to Meaning of Catholic. We will be promoting this book as it comes out. Michael will have more videos explaining various aspects of this text when it comes out. Um, so any final thoughts before we we close out, Michael? Well, one last, link, one last thing I was going to mention is, you know, 2017, the 100 year anniversary of Fatima. It's also the was the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And then think about 1517 to 1717 when English masonry became a thing to 1917. You have this weird 200 year interval and that's 500 years. You know, that's half a millennium and 
it's all just been Satan shedding his skin into a new form that keeps degenerating further and further away from Christendom. And so, you know, I can't help but notice a weird sort of echo, perhaps, of the idea of Satan unbound. And, uh, you know, it just kind of repeats a bit. So there's a lot of things, I think, culminating in that 2017 year that are very interesting. And so, you know, we see a lot of it going on now. And I think that, you know, we just have to clean up our own lives best we can. And that's the that's all we can do. And I did a lot of looking into Fatima and stuff like that. And at some point I decided to step back and just like, okay, I've absorbed all the information I can about it. Now I just got to do what I can in my own life. And then whatever's going to happen is whatever's going to happen. You know, and I think that that gives you a lot more peace internally <laughs> if you just kind of let that be and realize that so many of these things are far beyond your control. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful way to end up. Uh, this whole show with uh, things are out beyond control. We're going to give this up to our lady as we already gave up um, Russia and Ukraine to our lady earlier today. So let's pray an Ave to close this out and um, celebrating this great feast. It's a wonderful day to give thanks to God. The Annunciation is this great enmity incarnate in our lady. This is the icon of our lady of Fatima. So let's pray an Ave offering up uh, for the intentions of today, which are to crush the head of the serpent. This is this great day of the incarnation, which is the beginning of the crushing of the head of the serpent. Let's pray. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus. Et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.